Kings chapter 6, verse 8 reads like this. It says, Now the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with his servants, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not pass this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. Then the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him. And thus he warned him, and he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing, and he called his servants and he said to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, there's a spy here because somebody's telling all of our business. And one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, which is in Israel, tells the king of Israel words that you speak in your bedroom. And so he said, Go and see where he is, that I might send and get him. And I was, and it, as it was told, saying, Surely he is in Dothan. Therefore he sent horses and and chariots and a great army there. And there came by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he answered and he said, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those that are with them. And Elisha prayed and he said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he might see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of chariots and horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. We pray that you would speak to our hearts in a powerful way and help us to know, God, that you're fighting our battles even when we can't see it. Lord, that you have a host of angelic uh, beings around us, Lord, that are ministering even in areas that we can't see. And Lord, we thank you for everything you give to us for provision to be able to uh, accomplish your will in this life. And Lord, we thank you for it today. In Jesus' name, everybody said a big amen. Well, as I mentioned last week, we talked about those demon spirits. And today I want to talk about the ministry of angels. The ministry of angels. And that's what angels do. They minister. They are ministering spirits. Um, last week I mentioned to you that if God were to open up the veil of the spiritual realm, then we would be able to see a war, literally, that is going on around us. There is a spiritual battle. There are demons and there are angels. And they are doing God's business and the, the, the demons are doing the devil's business and they are at war with each other. We see that in Scripture where even over regions, Daniel was praying and couldn't get a breakthrough and the archangel had to fight the prince of Persia and after 21 days of fasting and prayer, he came and with a breakthrough in his hand. We see that there are uh, demonic spirits and yet the Bible mentions angels over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. And so we're going to look at these tonight there's not one single passage in the Bible that is exhaustive when it comes to angels and who they are and what they do. So it's really not my custom to preach or teach this way. I try to be more expository in my approach, which is simply taking a passage and letting it kind of speak for itself. But when you're dealing with doctrines in the Bible and things like that, sometimes we do have to take places and see what all of the Scripture says and bring it together and see what it says in the total picture. So tonight, that's what we're going to do about angels. I want to start off by saying this. There is a lot of misinformation in the world when it comes to the ministry of angels. All the way from the secular world to Hollywood, the, the, the uh, information out there is vast and endless. I will tell you that I grew up, you know, I was a child. I was born in the 80s, but you know, my bulk of my childhood, kindergarten and whatnot was was in the 90s, and, and um, you know, I remember being 8, 9, 10 years old at my grandmother's house, and there were several shows that we watched on a consistent basis. Uh, okay, so let's see how many people we have in the room that can pick out some of these. One show that we watched at my grandmother's house very often was, are you ready for this? Hee Haw. How many of you remember Grandpa Jones and Hee Haw, okay? That, listen, my great-grandmother was Pentecostal, sanctified, wouldn't wear a dress or wouldn't wear pants her whole life. I saw her wear uh, dress, uh, sweatpants when she couldn't leave the house when she was like <laughs> a couple of years away from death and she never left the house. She always wore uh, long hair. I mean, she was old-time Pentecostal, but, you know, she broke her sanctification to watch Hee Haw. She liked that show. 
That was my great grandmother. My grandmother was not as sanctified. She watched Columbo. Does anybody remember Columbo? Yeah? What about Knight Rider? MacGyver, right? Well, there was another one of these shows that, that we watched all the time, and it was called Highway to Heaven. Anybody remember that? Well, very cool fact, and I don't, I don't like to name drop or brag about stuff like this. My family lived in California until I was five years old, and my dad drove for a, uh, a pretty prestigious at that time trucking company, and he drove from Los Angeles to San Francisco down to Hollywood. That was his route. And what he did, he delivered uh, basically uh, furniture and stuff like that to movie studios and to Disney, Disneyland and stuff like that. And so I don't really remember it, but my brothers do. They're older than me. And um, so they said that when they were, you know, in junior high and stuff like that, we would get season passes to Disneyland and all these vendors would give my dad's things at Christmas time. But one of the perks of delivering to movie studios was sometimes at lunchtime he would catch them on break. And one day my dad, he's got some pictures, he told me that he was able to sit down and eat lunch with Victor France and Michael Landon from Highway to Heaven. And so I watched that show. I even, you can even go right now on, I think it's uh, on, on Hulu, I think it is, and you can watch all of the reruns. But anyway, that was kind of a show that was about angels. Then there was a show that was a little bit more modernized, and it was extremely extra biblical. It was called Touched by an Angel. Then there's a famous movie. I think all of us have probably watched it at Christmas time. Matter of fact, I have been told that I looked like this little boy with his big glasses when I was little because when I was little, not only did I have hair, it was white. It was very white blonde. And I had a little Ryder BB gun and a, a big frame glasses. You know what movie I'm talking about? It's a Wonderful Life. And what did, what did it say, the famous quote about the bell ringing. I know all of you probably can quote this. It says, teacher says, every time the bell rings, an angel gets its wings. That's in the movie. And so there's a lot of misinformation about angels and who they are. Some people have portrayed angels as being little puny, feminine, winged things. Other people have viewed them as naked babies floating around on a harp that you see on Hallmark cards or in Christmas ornaments. Um, you know, one of the things that, you know, when people are grieving at a funeral, it's really not the best time to correct theology. But one, one thing that always kind of gets me is when people are dealing with grief, they say things like, well, you know, God just needed another angel in heaven. And, you know, it, it may make you feel good in the moment, but the truth is, is that men don't become angels when we die. God created angels as we're going to see sometime in or before the six days of creation. We've got scripture for that we're going to look at in just a moment. But we need to answer the questions tonight. Who are angels? What do they do? And what should we know about them? So tonight we're going to look at a lot of different places. And Lance put in like 32,000 scriptures back there for me tonight. He's shaking his head because there were a lot of them. And so I may just breeze past some of those pretty quick, but the notes are in the app if you want to follow along. But anyway, tonight we're going to look at this. But before we do, I want to look at our text. Our text is found in 2 Kings chapter 6. And what we see is that Israel, much like they are today, even as we speak, are being attacked by their enemy. In biblical days and even, even now, Syria uh, tends to be one of the greatest enemies of Israel. Now, it's crazy how small Israel actually is. But uh, in the northern tip of Israel, you've got, you've got uh, Syria on one side, and then you've kind of got Jordan and Lebanon on the other. And it's crazy how the enemies of God surround that place, yet God has always kept her uh, protected. So what we see is that they are in battle, and the king is trying to strategize and those types of things. And every time the king tries to do something, it's like the people of God know what's going on. And they're like, do we have a spy in the middle of our camp? And somebody speaks up and says, no, but Elisha, the prophet, whenever you speak, king, somehow he hears the conversations that are in your bedchamber. And God was speaking the plans of the enemy to the people of God. And so the servant got up one day, troubled, and uh, we see this as we begin to look. Down in verse 13 of this passage, look at it with me one more time. It says, so he went and he says, go and see that you may see where he is, that I may send and get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore, he sent the 
horses and the chariots. This is important for you to see. The horses and the chariots. Everybody say the horses and the chariots. Okay, these are the enemies, horses and chariots. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. And the servant of the man of God arose and went out. So Elisha's servant got up. I, mean, I can just imagine he was sleeping good. Now, I'm going to tell on myself for a moment. My wife will tell you this is true. Normally, I'm a pretty light sleeper. I had a couple days last week. I slept so hard. For the first 15 minutes, I woke up. I didn't even know what day it was. That was the best sleep of my life. I'm telling you, I'm like, ooh, Sunday, isn't it? I better get up and get ready to church. And, uh, and so anyway, you imagine when you wake up startled or when you wake up uh, kind of bum-fuzzled is the word I'm going to use, and you're like, whew, it hits you right first thing when you wake up. And I can imagine this servant of the prophet goes out and he hears the chariots and the horses of Syrian armies, and he goes out there and he wipes his eyes and he goes, wow. Wow. Elisha. This. And they're looking at all of that, and he begins to get fearful and gripped in his heart. And yet, Elisha prays a prayer that is so significant. I think Elisha uh, said to him, followed up from verse 15, says, When the servant of the man of God rose out early and he went, he saw the army surround the city. He said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And I love what Elisha said. Elisha said this He said, Do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, what a statement of faith. Now, I was preaching to the men out of the prison. I've been doing a, a revival. Pastor Jose's out there preaching tonight at the prison. Um, I'll be out there tomorrow night, Friday night. But I've been preaching about the resurrection. And Thomas, who we've called Doubting Thomas, what did he say? He said, I won't believe it unless I see and I feel the nail prints in his hand. Well, Elisha didn't need to see that. He knew what God was doing. He knew the plans of God. And so what happened? He said, I don't need to see this, God. I believe you. He said, you don't need to fear, my friend. There be more that be with us than those that be with them. But for your sake, Lord, I pray, would you give my friend some confidence? Would you open my servant's eyes that he could see? And the Bible says that he, God lifted, literally what happened? He lifted the veil of the spiritual realm. And he saw chariots and horses and chariots of fire surrounding the Syrian army. And there were more that be with the people of God than were with Syria. Do you know what God allowed this servant of the prophet to see? He allowed him to see the angelic host of heaven fighting on behalf of God's people. Can I tell you something right now? Hamas may be firing rockets at Israel, but still to this day, there be more that be with Israel than they that be with his enemies. And God will stand by her no matter what to the last nth degree. So what we need to see is that God showed them that these angelic beings were there to do business. So as we're looking at this tonight, let's ask some questions what are they? What do they do? What should we know about them? And so we're going to look at all of this together. And so tonight, here's enough. If you're taking notes, just write this one thing down and you can write some stuff under it. The first thing you need to know is this. Angels, number one, are created beings. Angels are created beings. What we know is that angels witnessed the creation of the earth. That's found in Job chapter 38, verse 4 and verse 7. Job was complaining. How many of you remember the story of Job? Job's complaining. You know, God, I wish I wasn't even born. And, and you know, I've experienced this and I experienced that. And what did God say to Job? He said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding, Job. And he says uh, in verse number uh, 7, he says, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. A reference to the angelic host of heaven. Then Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 uh, tells us this. If you can put that reference on the screen. It says, thus the heavens and the earth and all of the what hosts of them were created. Angels were created by God in the beginning. Here's another thing we know about these created beings. Psalm 68 verse 17 tells us 
that they are an innumerable amount of, of, of angels. Look, the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord among them as in Sinai in the holy place. Then he goes on to say something very similar in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. But you have come to the Mount Zion and to the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to a what? Innumerable company of angels. So we don't know how many. There's not a number, but the Bible says it's an innumerable number of angels that God created in the beginning of this thing. And they're simply ministering spirits who do His bidding. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, men do not become angels. That is vitally, vitally, vitally important. Vitally important for us to understand that, that angels are God's servants and His messengers, but you and I who have an eternal soul, we do not become angels. In fact, the Bible says that angels look on us with wonder because they've never experienced salvation like we have. So it's interesting. So number one, angels are created beings. Here's the second thing that I'd like for you to see about angels. Number two, angels have differences. In other words, all angels are not the same. They're not the same. And uh, the Bible gives different names for those. There are seraphim, there are cherubim, there are archangels, there are even guardian angels. And For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, uh, God, when Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, uh, there was a cherubim placed at the garden to guard it. We also find that there are other angelic beings the Bible talks about. We'll get to those in just a moment. But I'll tell you one that's interesting. And I believe this with, with all of my heart. I believe <clears throat> that there are guardian angels. I believe there are guardian angels. You know, sometimes people make that out to be a folklore thing or even a Catholic thing or, or something like that. But the Bible tells us that one, thing, one of the things that angels do is that they guard God's people. Uh, in Daniel, the angel uh, uh, Michael is described as the great prince who has charge over your people. That's Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. And so we see that the angels have charge over God's people. But let me give you an interesting verse that maybe you've not read before. Maybe you've kind of read over it. But I want you to look with me at Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Here's what Jesus said. It says, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. I want, you to, I want you to think about that. Jesus says, don't despise one of these little ones. I, I believe he's referring to the little children. He says, don't despise them. He says, because their angels in heaven are always in the face of their Father, Father God. Now, that's interesting because... You have this concept of maybe that God has assigned each person an angel in life. Now, I don't know that. that doesn't, scripture doesn't concretely say that. But it infers that, that, that children, at least, have angels assigned to them. Now, let me stop here and say something because it needs to be said. It shouldn't have to be said, but it needs to be. When you go from Genesis to Revelation, nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that we're to seek out angels or to talk to angels or to worship angels. We worship God. In fact, every time an angel appeared to somebody in a visible form and somebody tried to bow down before him, the angel rebuked them and said, fear God, worship him. And so angels are not to be, because people have gotten goofy with stuff throughout the years. And what happens when people get goofy with a doctrine or a truth is we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater and totally miss everything, but we can't afford to do that with the Word of God because the Word of God's not a buffet. Amen. We don't get to pick what we like and disregard what we don't. We have to take it, even the parts we like and don't like, the tough parts, the easy parts, and even the stuff that we can't understand, we have to chew on it and take it by faith. But we do know that the Bible says that the angels behold the face of their Father in heaven, so don't offend little children is what it says. But if that's not interesting enough, we see some other things that are pretty cool. Psalm 91, right, uh, talks about He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. Um, then we see um, the angels in Exodus 23 and, and Psalm 34. And so we personally believe 
that these angels that guard the people of God, could it be? Could it be? Look with me in Luke chapter 16, verse 22 real quick. It's on the screen. It's a story of the rich man and Lazarus told by Jesus. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and was also buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes. So we see that there were angels apparently assigned to little children. And according to this passage, once again, I'm not trying to make a doctrine where there's not a apparent doctrine in the Bible, but I'm just tying some pieces together to make you think a little bit. Apparently, according to this Bible, believers, this verse, this beggar had an escort into heaven by an angel. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I want to tell you a story. Um, about probably about 10, 12 years ago, I was uh, pastoring down in Louisiana and I was having a really rough time, very, very just a rough spiritual battle of plowing through years and years of stuff. And, and I was discouraged. I mean, I was discouraged. How many of you remember when Elijah came down off of the mountain with the prophets of Baal. And I mean, God just called down, He just called down fire from heaven and, and totally annihilated and humiliated the prophets of Baal. And then Elijah gets word that Jezebel's about to kill him or wants to kill him. And so all of a sudden, he sees fire fall down from heaven. And the next scene, he is running for his life, asking God to kill him. And he finds himself underneath a juniper tree, wishing that he would die. And, uh, and uh, the Bible says that he slept and an angel came and, and ministered to him and gave him some cake to eat. By the way, it's the first reference of angel cake in the Bible. Angel food cake is from God, okay? I don't even think it has calories in it. It's going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But God gave him angel food cake. The Bible says, and he ministered to him. He told him to eat and, and, and to get some rest. And, and so anyway, I wasn't to that point, but I was, I was to a point to where I was just, whew, I was just really rough around the edges and kind of burnt out. Life had just been very difficult. The uh, uh, long-term pastor of our church at that time who I had replaced, he was there for 34 years, he died in the middle of me being there, and it, it brought a whole slew of emotions, and, and it was a really rough time. Well, even Jesus, when he was baptized, right, and he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days, 40 nights, when the devil left Jesus, you know what the Bible says? It says, and the angels came and ministered to him. The angels came and ministered to him. And I remember being in my bedroom. I remember telling my wife about it. She was working at the Louisiana district office at that time. And I was so discouraged. I was laying in my bed and I was praying. And I turned and I looked like this. And God is my witness. Strike me dead if I'm lying. I saw a big, beautiful angel, probably 12, 13 feet tall with a big sword and a big shield. And I'm, I'm, I don't see this stuff. You've got to understand, I'm not a devil behind a bush kind of person or always seen, uh, you know, taking trips to the third heaven type of person, you know. I don't see this all the time. But I saw it for a second. And I, I had such an overwhelming, like, awe. Oh, I turned around and I turned back and looked and it was gone. And I knew that God was with me. See, what does the Bible say about angels? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 7. Look at this. And the angels, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. The next verse, you don't have to turn there, it says that, that they're ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. Who are the heirs of salvation? Humans are. We are. God put his spirits these ministering spirits on the earth, I don't know what that is, the ministering spirits on the earth to come and help us. They're coming to fix that tomorrow, supposed to. Just a side note there. We've had lots of issues with that. Edit this out of the tape later. But uh, anyway, his ministering spirits, they came to minister to those who are the heirs of salvation. Now, I want you to see a couple of things that angels do because I think these are very important. One thing angels do, number one, is they deliver messages. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30, it was the angel of the Lord that came to Mary and said, you shall give, bring forth a son, and his name shall be called Jesus. And an angel came to a little virgin girl named Mary with the announcement of the virgin birth and her coming to bring Jesus into the world. That another angel came, and in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, brought peace to Joseph after this message from Mary came because 
He was distraught and he was thinking, do I put her away privately? People are going to talk about me. What should I do? And so what happens is, is that the angel comes and brings a message. Then what do we see? We see that same thing. I don't have these references down here, but we see the same thing in the Old Testament. The angel came and uh, basically comes to uh, Manoah, Samson's father and his parents, and says, you're going to have a son and he's going to be a Nazarite. He won't take wine. He won't touch the seed of a grape. He won't cut his hair, but God will, will be upon him. And so uh, time and time again, the angel of the Lord appeared to people in the Old Testament. I remember, I believe it was in the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel had a vision and, and they saw the man with the measuring rod. And, and we see all types of angelic things. And he says, who are you? He says, uh, are you, uh, whose side are you on? And he says, are you on the Lord's side? And he says, neither. I'm not here to pick sides. I'm here to take over. The Lord is God. We see that in Ezekiel. We see different types of imagery when it comes to angels. But here's another thing they do. They not only bring messages, they also give divine assistance. In Daniel chapter 6, whenever Daniel would not heed the call to cease and desist from prayer, when he wouldn't cease and desist from worshiping his God and not bowing down to worship the image, what happened? When they busted in and found Daniel praying, they said, we'll take care of him. We'll put him in the lion's den. And so they threw him down in there with the lions. And you know what Daniel did? He laid right to sleep. He laid right to sleep all night. I would have loved to see the look on those lions' face when they tried to open their massive jaws to devour Daniel. But in the morning when they woke up, what happened? They saw Daniel there with the mouth of the lion shut because in the night, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord shut the mouth of the lion. Literally, the angel of the Lord with his big strong hand reached down with his angel fingers or his angel hands and shut the mouth of that lion where it could not devour the man of God. Then in Acts chapter 12 is another interesting story. The apostle Peter finds himself in prayer. I mean, it finds himself in prison. The church is praying for him. He's getting ready to be executed. Now, I don't know about you, but something about execution doesn't sound too great to me. You know, I absolutely believe, you know, I don't know what that is, but I, don't, I absolutely believe that they keep people on death row for too long. Now, I'm not going to get into, do you believe in the death penalty? Do you not? Or whatever. Um, I, I believe in, in cases, um, people have been put to death that uh, years later were proven to be innocent due to forensics and DNA. And so I think it's got to be real stringent and whatever. But one of the cruelest things about, about the death penalty is people wake up every day not knowing when their day's coming. <laughs> You know, I mean, in a sense, you know what I'm saying? All of us know that we're not going to live forever, but they literally wake up not knowing when they're going to the, you know, be strapped down and all of those things. I mean, just wake up and say, hey, bud, it's time. It's time to go. And so there's such an overwhelming sense of, of angst, if you will. And I want you to imagine being Peter asleep in his prison cell with the guards there guarding him as he's getting ready to be executed for preaching the gospel. And while, while that's happening, the church is having an all-night prayer meeting for Peter. And they're praying and they're praying. And you, you got to understand, the, these, these folks, and I don't mean, mean no harm by this, they weren't quiet prayers. The, these were spirit-filled people. These were, these were Book of Acts upper room disciples who knew how to pray and knew how to call on the name of Jesus. And, and while they were calling and petitioning God, you know what happened? An angel of the Lord showed up in prison that night with Peter. And he opened the door of Peter's prison. Peter snuck out. Goes up to the prayer meeting. He knocks on the door. The Bible says a little girl ran to the door. Wipes her eyes and says, Is that Peter? That can't be Peter. He's in prison. So she goes back and tells the rest of them, Hey, it's Peter. And they say, No, it's not. And Peter's like, Yeah, guys, it really is me. See, they didn't even have faith in their own prayer. I'm glad God moves in spite of us sometimes. 
But their prayer, see, it wasn't time for Peter's departure. So divine intervention happened. And what happened? They came right in and stepped up. I want you to look at 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 15. Uh, notice this. It says, So the Lord sent the plague upon, the, upon Israel from the morning to the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Now, if you know the context of this story, uh, looking back in 2 Samuel, we see where you know, Israel had, had done some stuff that they shouldn't have, and, and David numbered Israel, and, and God actually was like, David, I'm going to let you pick your punishment. How many of your parents ever let you pick your punishment before? Okay, you're either going to get grounded, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. That didn't happen to me. They just I, just, I just caught it before I saw it. I didn't even get a chance to see it coming, you know. Just, whew, all right, got my punishment. But what happened was the angel of the Lord in one swoop took out 70,000 people. Now let me ask you a question. If one angel can take out 70,000 people, what can 10,000 angels do? I'm telling you, God's angels are ministering spirits sent forth to do His business. Now, here's a bonus scripture for you tonight. This one's not in the notes, but Hebrews also tells us this. He says that we ought to be kind when we're dealing with people because we never know when we're ministering to angels unaware. I'm about to tell on myself with another one of these 90 shows. And I know that there was some, uh, you know, Stephen Barnett's sister from the, you know, Tornado Hospital thing was, was in Unsolved Mysteries, right? You remember that show? I don't know. Maybe saved folks aren't supposed to watch Unsolved Mysteries. Maybe it's too close to spooky stuff. I don't know. But there were several of them where, you know, that guy had the most, you know, there's some people who like just have amazing voices, right? And I can't remember that guy's name, but I love the way he narrated that show. Uh, I'll tell you another person I like. I, I would love to have audio. By, now, these are two polar opposites by Morgan Freeman and John Hagee. They have the most awesome voices to read and narrate. Well, I remember him talking on Unsolved Mysteries about this man who broke down in the middle of the night. And, you know, uh, there was nobody around. He was out of gas and blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, this mysterious person showed up out of nowhere and, you know, fixed the tire, put gas in the car, whatever, you know, and he said, went to turn around and tell the guy, thank you, and he disappeared. I've heard that story a lot from believers. A lot. Heard it a lot where mysteriously somebody shows up to help and then, boom, they're disappeared. You can't find them anymore. Are they angels or are they just good Samaritans? We don't know, but the Bible does say that we entertain angels unaware sometimes. We just don't know who's around us. That's why we should be kind to people. That's why we should be lovable and gentle and honorable to people because we just never know. I'll tell you a story real quick as I get ready to close. My, my mom was here Sunday. She, she may not even remember this, but I remember one night we were commuting home from work. We lived about uh, 20 miles from Stamps, Arkansas to Magnolia, Arkansas. She worked in Magnolia, and we were living in Stamps area. And I had rode to her, rode with her to work for something. And I don't know if I stayed with a friend. I really don't remember the details, but I remember what happened like it was yesterday. We were driving home, and I remember it was dark. We were in a long stretch of highway. Something happened. We went off of uh, the median of the road. The car went up. It was like we went on two wheels. And um, I'm telling you, with, for all intents and purposes, we should have wrecked that car, should have flipped over. I've seen people do it before. But we prayed. We called on the name of Jesus, and it was like a hand just came and pushed that car right back onto that road and caused us to keep going straight. You say, well, it's just a coincidence. That's just aerodynamics. I tend to think that, that God has angels watching over us, amen, and ministering to us whenever we can't even see them. And I would, I would probably uh, wager tonight that you and I have been saved from situations that we will never know about until we get to eternity 
because of God's supernatural divine intervention in our lives. I believe it with all of my heart. Why is that important tonight? And I close. Why is that important? It's important because we need to know, number one, that we're not alone. God gave us His Word. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the church. And you know what? Those things are awesome. But He also gives us ministers who are behind the scenes that we never see, we never know. As I mentioned, we're not supposed to, to, to talk to them or you know, anything like that. We don't really have a, a good theological reference for things like that. But, um, you know, it's interesting to note that at times God, just like the prophet, just like the time in my discouragement, God can just give you a glimpse of something supernatural and give you some hope. Give you some hope. You know, if I could leave you on a note of encouragement tonight, it's this. Is that one of the great truths of the Bible is that whenever you feel like you're alone, you're really never alone. Alone. 